Okay, topic two, part two. Hopefully this won't be as long as the first part. Um, this will actually go a little bit quicker. Um, but we've talked about carbohydrates, lipids, proteins. The only other biomolecules that we haven't talked about are DNA and RNA. So the first 2.6 is about the structure of DNA and RNA. So in general, um, for... Uh, nucleic acids, we have three main important parts. We have the um, phosphate, which is usually um, that circle. We have a sugar, and then we have the nitrogenous base or nitrogen base. Um, and so, like I said, those are the main parts. Um, you do need to know the difference between DNA and RNA. There are three main differences. Uh, the first one being the, sh the name of the sugar, the type of sugar used. So um, both are both deoxyribose and ribose are um, pentose sugars, meaning that they um, have... The ring is made of five molecules um, with an oxygen at the top, and then the others are carbon, um, but they are slightly different. Don't worry too much about the difference, um, except you do need to know, remember, you need to know what ribose looks like and how to draw ribose. Um, the other main difference we have is the, the actual structure. So DNA is a double helix, so it kind of has like a winding staircase look. Um, so like two strands. That's a terrible drawing, but you get what I mean. Um, and then ribose is, or sorry, RNA is single stranded. So it kind of looks like this. It's just one strand. Uh, and then the last main difference are the bases. Uh, DNA uses T, which is thymine, and RNA uses U, which is uracil. So all the other bases are the same except T and U, okay? Um, so some other important structures within, within DNA, you do need to know um, that the bond between the phosphate and the sugar is a covalent bond. And the bond between two uh, nitrogenous spaces is a hydrogen bond. Um, and so you do need to know how to draw the structure of DNA, um, like this picture. And you do need to know, um, like you'll have to be able to, when you draw this, you have to know A pairs with T, C pairs with G. And you'll need to know... Um, the types of bonds, covalent bonds between the phosphate and sugar, hydrogen bonds between the two um, base pairs. Uh, the last thing in terms of structure you need to know about is the complementary base pairs, which should be pretty, you should already be familiar with. Um, DNA and RNA, again, like I said, the difference is the T and the U. So in DNA, A, adenine pairs with T, thymine, in RNA, adenine pairs with uracil. Um, but then in both DNA and RNA, C pairs with G, um, C cytosine, and G for guanine. So you need, do need to remember those pairs. Okay, moving on from structure, we have DNA trans, uh, replication, transcription, and translation. So there is... Um, you do need to know that DNA is semi-conservative. That's an important term that you need to know. There is a um, an experiment that you need to know about. Um, Mendelssohn and Stahl. Um, and so for that, I don't want to get too much into it because I don't want this to be like a million years long like the other one was. So uh, to kind of go over that one, I would make sure that you look in your um, either your textbook or Bio Ninja has a lot of good information um, about that specific experiment and they may ask you about it. So just make sure you understand that. Um, but I will explain the the 
what semi-conservative means. So basically, it's this idea that when DNA is replicated, one of the, with the new DNA that's created, one strand is the original strand from the original DNA molecule, and then one strand is completely new. So basically, it's kind of half and half, half new, half old. Um, so that's what semi-conservative means, okay? Then you also need to know the two main enzymes that are important in DNA replication. Helicase is the first one. That's the enzyme that unwinds the DNA so that it can be replicated. And then you need to know about DNA polymerase, which is the enzyme that links the nucleotides together, okay? And like I said, more on that experiment uh, is online um, by a ninja or your textbook. And then you also need to know PCR and the process of PCR. Um, so the polymerase chain reaction, this is basically the, um, it's a form of biotechnology that is able to replicate small um, sequences of DNA. It can replicate them very, very quickly. So you do kind of need to understand the process. So basically what happens is there's a small piece of DNA, um, a sequence, a small sequence that is selected to be copied. What then happens is they raise the temperature to 95 degrees Celsius, and that, um, that high temperature will basically break the hydrogen bonds between the bases. And so then you have two strands and they're separated, okay? Then what they do is they lower the temperature back to 54 degrees Celsius. And when you lower the temperature, that basically makes the hydrogen bonds want to form again. So instead of the bonds forming between the two original strands, there are these RNA or sorry, these DNA primers kind of all throughout. There's like a million of them all around these DNA, these separated DNA strands. And so instead of the DNA strands linking back up together, the primers actually bind to the original strands, which you can see in this picture right here. Um, and then they raise the temperature again um, to basically replicate that new strand a bunch and bunch and bunch and bunch and bunch of times. Um, so, and in particular, you do need to know about TAC DNA polymerase. So that's the specific um, enzyme. I believe they, it's um, an enzyme that was taken from E. coli. I need to check on that. It's definitely an archaea bacteria that it was taken from. So it might not be E. coli. I have to look. But it's taken, it was basically taken from an archaea bacteria. If you remember... Archaea bacteria are like bacteria that uh, are, an ex are extremophiles, so they can live in very extreme temperatures or very extreme pHs. Um, so this TAC DNA polymerase won't denature at high temperatures, so that's why they have this like very special um, DNA polymerase that is used in the PCR. Um, so that's basically the quick and dirty process of PCR. Uh, okay, so that is DNA replication going into transcription and translation. So transcription and translation is basically DNA um, is transcribed into mRNA, mRNA is messenger RNA, and then that messenger RNA is um, translated into a polypeptide, which will eventually become a protein. So it's the transcription and translation is the process of going from DNA to a protein. So it's the synthesis of a protein, essentially. So transcription is the first part we have, and it takes place in the nucleus. So um, nucleus, 
okay? Um, and it takes place, well, it takes place in the nucleus, but uh, it happens thanks to this enzyme called RNA polymerase. Oh, did I spell that right? Polymerase, polymerase. Yeah, I did. Ah, okay. It looked wrong. I don't know. Anyway, so um, RNA polymerase basically um, unwinds the DNA, and there are free RNA nucleotides just kind of like hanging around. They bind to the DNA, um, like right here, um, and they form um, hydrogen bonds. But then eventually they separate again and you have this mRNA molecule. And so this mRNA molecule will then leave the nucleus and head to the ribosome for translation. So the mRNA um, strand is going to head to uh, a ribosome. Either the ribosome might be part of the rough ER um, or it could just be a free floating ribosome. Um, but this process takes place like in the cytoplasm on a ribosome. Um, and this is a picture from BioNinja that basically just explains what's happening. So um, th on the mRNA strand, three um, bases equal a codon. And so that codon is going to basically tell us what um, amino acid is going to be used. So um, every codon codes for a specific amino acid. So what happens is we have the messenger RNA um, and then we have these structures called tRNA, which are transfer RNA. The transfer RNA um, has an anticodon and the anticodon is gonna bind with the codon. Um, and so the tRNA has the anticodon kind of on the bottom, and then at the top, it will have a, an amino acid. Um, and so eventually what happens is the tRNA comes, the anticodon binds to the codon, and then up here what happens is the, po or the amino acids are going to bind to each other um, with peptide bonds. And then eventually, once that is completely translated and the polypeptide is complete, it will unlink from the tRNA. And then depending on what kind of protein it is, like if, for example, if it's a globular protein, um, that polypeptide will fold into the protein that it's going to become. So that's the quick and dirty with translation, uh, transcription and translation. Okay. Last two things, we have cellular respiration and photosynthesis. So remember, there are two types of cell respiration. You need to know anaerobic versus aerobic respiration. But the basic process is taking the um, monosaccharide that we know as um, glucose, and we are breaking it down to get ATP, okay? So you need to know ATP is an energy source. It's used as energy um, or it releases energy in, re in reactions. It's used for a lot of important processes such as active transport, um, synthesizing large molecules, um, and also like movement of things um, in the cell, like muscle contractions. Um, it's used a lot for movement. So, anaerobic is without oxygen present. So, an kind of stands for like not or no. So, there's no oxygen present. And so, um, because of anaerobic respiration without oxygen, there's actually a smaller yield of ATP. So, not as much ATP is going to be produced from anaerobic respiration. Um, you need to know the difference between animals um, and yeast and plants. So in animals, glucose is broken, broken down into lactate. Um, again, ATP is still created. 
Um, but in yeast and plants, the glucose is broken down into ethanol and CO2. So you do need to know the difference. And you do need to make sure you kind of understand um, one of the things that IB wants you to know is this idea of lactate. Um, and a lot of times anaerobic respiration in humans is used, um, for example, like when you're working out. Um, and you're working out and you're using your like muscles a lot and you're using them so quickly that um, there's not enough time to get the oxygen to your muscles. When you feel that burn in your muscles, that is actually the lactate buildup. So um, uh, this process in particular is very important um, when you're like working out, when there's muscle contractions and you're using your muscles. Um, a lot in like a very short period of time. Then we have aerobic respiration, which is in the presence of oxygen. You're going to have, have a higher yield of ATP, um, and that you do need to know is glucose and oxygen is going to form ATP, um, and then you'll also have CO2 and H2O as your byproducts, okay? So that's the quick and dirty um, for respiration. And then 2.9 is photosynthesis, CO2 and H2O, so um, carbon dioxide and water form glucose and oxygen. Um, you also need to make sure that you understand that it's a process of converting light energy from the sun to chemical energy um, or stored energy in the form of this glucose molecule. So photosynthesis takes place in chloroplasts. Chloroplasts. Um, and chloroplasts contain chlor chlorophyll. Okay. And chlorophyll is a photosynthetic pigment, and pigments help absorb light, basically. So chlorophyll is going to absorb red and blue light most effectively, um, but it absorbs green light much less effectively because it reflects that green light instead of absorbing it. So you do, this is important, you need to know, red and blue are going to be the best light um, and going to be the most effective, and then green light is not very effective, okay? The last thing for photosynthesis are the limiting factors. So we have temperature, light intensity, and CO2 concentration. So basically with temperature, um, I'll just kind of draw these out for you a little bit. So temperature, if it is too cold or too hot, photosynthesis like does it isn't as um, like effective. So basically we kind of have this like up and down. Um, so like the rate of photosynthesis increases, but then kind of eventually decreases as the temperature continues to increase. Um, for light intensity, um, no light is not good because there's no source of energy. Um, but then at an eventual point, it just kind of levels off. Let me, so it kind of looks like this and then it'll eventually kind of like level off. Um, so if there's no light, that's going to be a limiting factor. But once you have a lot of light, there's going to be some other limiting factor there. Um, it's kind of same thing with CO2 concentration. If there's not a lot of CO2, you're not going to have a lot of photosynthesis because you need CO2. Um, but eventually, CO2, because remember this is um, because of that enzyme, Rubisco. Remember we talked about Rubisco. Um, and Rubisco is an enzyme that helps fix um, CO2 from the atmosphere. So eventually, um, you're going to reach this kind of saturation point um, and photosynthesis. And that enzyme can only work, you know, so quickly. So eventually, you are going to have um, this kind of like plateau. Um, so yeah. That is quick and dirty, hopefully quicker than part one. Bye-bye now.